Okay, so let's return now to this outcrop. We can zoom in here to get a sense of scale. This horizontally oriented pole, which uh, geologists use in the field, it's called a Jacob's staff. It's been marked with blue duct tape to show 10 centimeter segments along its length, so that gives us a sense of how big these things are. The unit that it's resting in is clearly pretty shaly because we have this big old slope coming down here that's all covered with little shaly bits and pieces. If we go up to the outcrop itself and we zoom in there, we can see lots of those fine little flaky layers, the facility that characterizes a shale. And so that tells us that basically we have a shaly unit there. That shaly unit has got to be uh, the oldest feature in our outcrop. So the deposition of the mud that made that shale must have come first. And we know that because it underlies the next major unit in the sequence, which is this very distinctive jet black coal. You can see that there are two coal seams here, not just one, but two. Uh, again, separated by some very fine grained mud uh, that has been turned to a shale. The lower coal seam is the thinner of the two, and you can see that it basically pinches out going here to the left, but then it shows up again. So there's basically like a little um, gap going through here where the, uh, sh the coal was cut across by uh, some shale, and that shale has filled in that uh, old channel probably. Then we've got uh, the big thicker seam of coal. Um, if we go on top of that, we have a mix of shale and sandstone. If we zoom in on that shale sandstone mix, we can see it's relatively thin bedded at the bottom. And then we have more massive gray colored sandstone going higher up in the sequence. You can see lots of little rusty spots all over the place here. Those indicate the weathering of some iron rich mineral, probably pyrite. And then if we zoom out again, we can see that all of those units have been tilted up on end, overlying them, truncating them, cutting across them, is this uh, overlying light colored unit. If we zoom in on that, we see that it's mostly sandstone, but it's also got some pebbles in it. So part of it would have to be classified as a conglomerate. So if we zoom all the way in here, this is an example of some of those pebbles. You'll also notice there that it displays cross bedding. So for instance, here's some cross bedding where we must have had a current moving from the right toward the left in order to deposit this sandstone. Those are the major units in this outcrop. To tell the story of this outcrop, we would probably say that the following sequence of events must have taken place. We started off with the deposition of mud as recorded by the lowermost shale. Then we had a couple of uh, periods of time, one longer than the other, when we deposited peat, and that results in the two coal layers. Then we had another period of time where the water energy was increasing and we shift from depositing shale to depositing sandstone. And then all those layers must have been tilted by some process, perhaps by mountain building, perhaps by slumping, uh, a form of mass wasting. And at any rate, they ended up being rotated out of their original horizontal orientation into a tilted orientation. At that point, erosion took place, truncating the ends of those different layers, and then deposition resumed with the overlying sandstone and conglomerate. So sand and pebbles were deposited, and based on the size of those pebbles, we would be justified in saying that the water energy was relatively high, and we would also be able to say uh, that it was likely deposited under the influence of a directional current on the basis of the cross bedding. So I would say that that's probably a river deposit up there on the top. That's the sort of thing geologists are able to do when we go to outcrops like this. We're able to look at the various pieces and then by thinking about how those pieces must have formed and looking at their relationship to one another, we can tell an overall geological story.